go on. So good evening, everyone. I hope you can uh, see the slides and you can hear me. So uh, thank you to Samahin Verma for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to talk about uh, some of the work that we have been doing. I know it's a turbulence group and uh, I've been working in turbulence, but of late I have been more interested in this topic of uh, what equations are there which uh, could take us beyond the Navier Stokes. So I thought I will share some of these uh, I mean, I'm quite excited by these. So some of these excitements, I should say, with all of you uh, through this work. And in that context, I will introduce the so-called the Burnett and the Grad equations. Uh, these are higher order equations. Uh, and then we will ask the question, is it possible to solve these equations analytically? And uh, we will also find out that these equations have severe limitations. Uh, because of which there is a need to solve uh, I mean, to obtain even more accurate equations. So how do we go about doing that is what we will try to do uh, towards the end of this talk. So uh, just to sort of, of course, this is something which is very elementary. Uh, what uh, I mean that uh, we're talking about, we're talking about it into how we got into this problem. So we were essentially looking at gas flow in micro channels. And as we know that uh, flow in micro channels is quite in fashion these days and that's what brought us to this topic and we were looking at gas flows which are internal flows which exhibit slipping at the wall and they have substantial compressibility effects so because of this combination uh, of properties they are not something which is well studied uh, and uh, if you look at these flows or at least when we started looking at these flows more closely we realized that so there are several non-intuitive and new results that one can obtain with these flows because there is a substantial difference in the flow physics uh, with these sort of flows because of these uh, properties that are highlighted here. And some of these uh, new uh, uh, non-intuitive effects, I will be talking about, uh, or at least some example of that, we will be seeing that in one of the later slides. But uh, this uh, essentially arises because in such sort of flows, uh, a new non-dimensional number, the Knudsen number, uh, becomes relevant. And the Knudsen number is defined as a mean free path of the gas to the characteristic length scale of the passage. And just to give you a sense, if you have 10 micron uh, passage and you have air under standard conditions, you will find Knudsen number as 10 to the power of 10 to minus two approximately, which would lie, for example, if you look at the scale of Knudsen number, which is then used to divide the flow into four different regimes, the, so the continuum regime, uh, which we are, of course, very used to seeing. We mostly assume that the flow is continuum. And of course, uh, on the other hand, this, is, this happens when Knudsen number is close to or tending to zero. Whereas if you go to the other extreme of Knudsen number tending to infinity, which is a free molecular regime. Uh, so these are the two sort of regimes that we are sort of quite used to seeing, or especially the continuum part. Whereas in sandwiched in between these two uh, extremes, we have two very important intermittent re regimes, which are the slip flow regime and the transition regime, where the Knudsen number is, let us say, of the order of unity. Uh, so it's not uh, sort of comparable. The two, two scales, lambda and L, becomes very comparable. And of course, that's when you get into the transition regime. And uh, this is, I mean, these two regimes essentially form the, uh, the focus of this talk. And a lot of interesting uh, things happen in this regime, for example, as this example is showing, uh, if you're looking at flow in a 10 micron channel, uh, normal air, you will find that we are essentially falling somewhere in the slip regime. So, and of course, this sort of uh, flow is relevant from practical point of view as well, whether it is micro devices, whether it is uh, flow uh, of air in these small pores of soil. And, uh, or if you're looking at uh, flow in lungs, or if you're looking at flow, which is happening at high altitude, uh, in all these cases, uh, the Knudsen number can become large. In these cases, uh, when the length scales are small and therefore uh, your uh, Knudsen number is large, whereas in the last case of an aircraft is the mean free path, which has become essentially very large because of the reduction in pressure that is happening. So this 
sort of flows do happen in uh, several cases in several places and therefore they are of practical interest and if you have to summarize in a single slide without getting into details about uh, uh, you know i mean in detailed literature survey what we would find now here what i have done is essentially classified things into three different categories one whether we are looking at theoretical sort of a flow uh, understanding or a theoretical theory based understanding or whether we are looking at a experimental based evidence and whether we are looking at the slip regime or we are looking at the slip and the transition regime and uh, whether we are looking at simple passages or we are looking at some more complex shapes like uh, what would be practically uh, sort of encountered so what we find that our theory for flow in a straight microchannel in the slip regime this is something which is mostly available if you look at experimental data for flow in a straight microchannel in the slip and the transition regimes this is also something which is available but if you were to look at the data experimental data for flow in complex microchannels in the slip and the transition regimes uh, of course complex we have not defined yet but we will see that it is some sort of a complex geometry uh, through which the flow is happening then that sort of a data is not really available to us the experimental data and if you are to look at the theory of flow in the transition regime this is also something which is not available so our focus has been in our group to look at uh, experiments in complex microchannels in the slip regime and uh, try to develop theory for flow in the transition regime and this is the thing that we are going to be mostly focusing on in this talk talk here the theory part of course uh, we will very briefly introduce uh, some experimental data uh, that we had obtained which would provide the motivation for looking at um, theory which is uh, more involved in the navier stokes so what we now mean by complex microchannels uh, we have some uh, three different type of passages passages which are shown here in the first case we have a sudden expansion the flow is coming from the left and then there is a sudden change in the cross sectional area which has been there and uh, of course this is a sudden uh, expansion flow if the flow is from left to right you can take the same uh, uh, apparatus and you can just reverse the flow direction and then it will become a sudden contraction so essentially there are two cases that one can study from this uh, single experimental setup similarly instead of going for a sudden expansion you can have a gradual expansion and again you can have a gradually expanding or a diverging passage or you can have a, uh, a slowly converging uh, flow uh, which can also be uh, can also be studied you can also have flow in a bend uh, passage like what is shown here so we were essentially doing experiment experiments in these cases with one of the earlier students with a few gases and uh, there were some thing very unexpected that we found if we were to look at in the flow regime uh, sorry in the slip flow regime this is for a sudden expansion case so uh, what was done here is that there are a lot of these pressure taps which are shown here on the tube walls which are essentially measuring the pressure as a function of position and that is what is plotted here for a pressure as a function of position this is where the sudden expansion is this is the junction of the two tubes and uh, surprisingly uh, what we found is that there is a discontinuity in the slope if you were to look at the slope from the left and the right you would find that there is a discontinuity in the slope that is encountered at the junction and this is something that a continuum flow would not exhibit for example and the other thing that we found is that there is although we went to reasonably large or very large area ratios and reasonably large renaults numbers there does not seem to be any evidence of flow separation that is happening in these cases uh, there is no eddy formation for example at these corners that is happening and um, and some of these things we try to explain through the large uh, uh, diffuse uh, diffusivity of the flow which is happening because of the low density that is uh, that is there but uh, i mean not getting into more details in this but what is important here is to realize as we had claimed earlier that when you get into the slip regime there are several non intuitive effects and flows that you can see and this is just one of the things that we're trying to to demonstrate and of course we have tried to solve this equations or this flow uh, numerically uh, using a commercial uh, solver uh, 
And surprisingly, what we found is that, and of course we have data for both certain expansion and certain contraction cases. And we found that in one of the case, we could get uh, a good agreement, reasonably good agreement. Um, whereas in the other case, when we reverse the flow direction and we try to do the, uh, do the simulations again, even our gross parameters are totally off. So it's not just whether we would have this recirculation region or not, uh, but overall mass flow rate versus pressure drop sort of fertilization is also not coming out good at all. So it sort of gave us some idea that uh, there are some things which are more involved in these sort of flows. And um, uh, one has to sort of maybe look at uh, not just trying to just change the boundary conditions and trying to do something minor, but we have to look at uh, a more uh, drastic sort of a thing like uh, whether the governing equation itself is, available, is uh, applicable in these cases or not. Of course, uh, I'm just going to present a few more evidences because we are going to on and all these are motivating, are going to motivate us to look at beyond the Navier-Stokes. So this is another example of uh, measurements which were done in, in our lab here, where we had, we were trying to measure the heat transfer coefficient in a very simple tube, uh, uh, in, in a tube sort of a pipe flow situation. So we had a water jacket, which is heated outside, and this is cold nitrogen in the slip regime, which is flowing inside. And we were just trying to measure the overall nestled number and what we were very surprised to find, if you plot the Nusselt number as a function of Knudsen number, you find that there is a huge drop uh, very quickly, uh, the Nusselt number drops, and it becomes very, very small. And if you were to compare this against uh, uh, the theoretical calculations, and there are a lot of uh, theoretical treatment of this problem, which is available in the literature, people would say that there should not be more than a 20% reduction in, in the value of the Nusselt number that one should find. Whereas what we are finding is several orders of magnitude reduction in the Nusselt number which is with an increase in, in Nusselt number. So again, this is indicating that something is amiss uh, or something is missing in our governing equations. And that's what we would like to uh, start uh, looking at. Now, these were the two sort of experimental based evidences from our lab. Now we can look at some evidences from the literature as well. This is a very simple quiet flow problem uh, where one would expect to have a linear variation in velocity. And uh, of course, um, uh, I mean, what, was, what has been found uh, through DSMC calculations from a lot of uh, different groups is that you, the velocity profile tends to become nonlinear. And of course, the Navier-Stokes will always simplify to this uh, second derivative of u with respect to y is equal to zero. Uh, which of course means that u is a linear function with respect to y. So you cannot explain this nonlinear behavior, whether you put in property variation or you try to do anything else, you will never be able to explain this nonlinear variation within the Navier-Stokes form formulation. Similarly, one can look at uh, another flow in a channel uh, where one finds that, uh, of course, one expects a parabolic distribution. And one, if you go to the slip regime, uh, you expect to get a parabolic distribution with slipping at the wall. Uh, these features do come out from the DSMC calculations as well. Again, there are several reports on that. But once you look at pressure as a function of y, uh, what you very surprisingly find is that pressure is not constant along the y direction. And of course, Navier-Stokes equation will always give you that dp dy is equal to zero, uh, which of course means that pressure has to be constant in the y direction. So, so again, this is uh, um, sort of pointing towards failure of the Navier-Stokes equations. And this is what sort of uh, brings us to the topic of this, uh, of this um, seminar. That, um, uh, I mean, so I mean that there is a need, definite need to look at this, uh, the equations which are beyond the Navier-Stokes. Of course, one can look at other flow situation like a flow uh, like a boundary layer over forming over a flat plate. And just at the leading edge, uh, there is a discontinuity. And if you try to go very close to the discontinuity, again, Navier-Stokes uh, equations fail. Uh, so there are enough examples. Okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Like, can you go back? Uh, you said the, the pressure gradient is varying, but it's very low in magnitude, right? Yes, like, that's right. Like 2 per, like 0.2% it looks like. Right. Right? So it's a very low magnitude, but there is a very systematic variation that has been noted. And again, noted in a lot of different groups. 
Yes, so you are right, it's a very small variation. And because it has been noted by so many people and there seems to be clear trend, uh, I mean, it is uh, not just, I mean, it, one cannot just dismiss it. Even the parallel flow approximation there, it's, it's an approximation. So we expect some sort of uh, probably a small magnitude like order epsilon uh, variation, depending on the ratio of the Y over H, like the height of the channel to the boundary layer. Yeah, but in this sort of a Poisson flow, one need not make any of those assumptions. No, one can, uh, yeah, I mean, yes, show it very analytically that the only thing that you would get from your cross stream momentum equation is dp dy is equal to zero. That's the only, I mean, dp dy term which has to go to zero. And zero. So it's not a order epsilon in that case, at least for. So it's exactly case. zero in that case. It is exactly zero in that case. If you are looking at an incompressible flow, fully developed situation. Okay. DP dy is exactly zero in that case, yes. Okay, thanks. So, um, okay, so basically what we have said is uh, there is definitely a need for looking beyond the Navier-Stokes. And uh, so we will uh, now introduce these two equations, Bernard equations and the Grad equations, uh, which are like a higher order continuum transport equations. But before doing that, let me just very quickly introduce uh, or just recall how the Navier-Stokes equations are derived because there are some subtle points uh, which will get carried forward in our discussion. So one can start off from the Newton's law of motion uh, where we have essentially the acceleration terms on the left and we have all the forces on the right. And um, the, uh, so at this stage, of course, our equation is uh, not closed. And one uh, is essentially introduces the constitutive model for uh, Newtonian or whatever type of fluid we are dealing with. And of course that helps to write out a separate relationship between the stresses and the velocity gradients. And of course that closes, uh, helps to close the equation. Of course, the other thing which shows up is that there are two coefficients of viscosity. And of course we just invoke the Stokes hypothesis and uh, we are left with one coefficient of viscosity mu in our equation. Uh, so this is, of course, done in a lot of different ways in a lot of textbooks, and people have been doing it, in, I mean, day in, day out. And there are no, nothing which is there in this whole procedure that one can find uh, that uh, where one could uh, find an issue and one could uh, sort of improve upon that and sort of say that, okay, if we were to explain the type of things that we were looking at in the, in the first half early part of the stock, one can explain it by adding certain terms which were neglected uh, and uh, so if you bring that in, then uh, we should hopefully be able to explain these anomalies. But there is nothing in this derivation which uh, will take you to that point. So that means that we'll have to now think of looking at the equations from a different point of view altogether. And this essentially happens if you look at, so, our, so we have to essentially change our starting point. And the alternate starting point that we can take is to start off from, from the Boltzmann equation. So this is, I will first give you an overview of uh, what can be done before getting into some more details. And I will use this chart to do that. So the Boltzmann equation can be uh, essentially solved in two different ways, which are given here, the Chapman and Scott expansion and or the grad uh, moment method. And uh, if you were to invoke this Chapman and Scott uh, method, you can drive a whole hierarchy of equations, depending on what order of terms you retain, and that will become clear when we go to the next slides, next few slides, that you can essentially obtain equations like Euler equations or the Navier-Stokes equations, or even higher order uh, in terms of nooks and number uh, equations like uh, Burnett equation and super Burnett equations. Uh, so, and if you were to sort of uh, follow the GRAD approach, then here is a totally different approach where you use Hermite polynomials and one obtains 13 moment equations or, and 26 moment equations and their variants like R13 and the R26 equations. So these equations collectively uh, will be called as higher order uh, hydrodynamic models. And of course, we are very used to, very familiar with this Euler and the Navier Stokes equations. And towards the end of this talk, I will be introducing this thing which is still tentative and therefore it is in dotted. So uh, now uh, with this as a very brief sort of uh, over, I mean, this is a very brief overview. Let me just get into a slight uh, math. I mean, I mean, these mathematical details are not very important. Uh, 
it's only the idea and how it flows is, is more important. Uh, so if you were to look at the Boltzmann equation, and if you were to take moments of this equation, uh, one can, because I mean here, okay, maybe one should say that in this Boltzmann equation, there is a single variable, which is F, uh, and of course there's a single equation. So if I can solve for my F, then of course, uh, uh, I have everything, for example, I can obtain my density uh, by taking the moment of that or uh, first moment, zeroth moment of that and the first moment, uh, I can get momentum and energy and so on. So I can essentially take F and I can take various moments and I can obtain the macroscopic quantities of interest like density, velocity and energy. Uh, but the issue is that I cannot uh, solve the Boltzmann equation uh, readily because of the complex collision term which is sitting on the right hand side. So one, what one does is essentially take moment of this equation, uh, of, the itself, of this equation itself uh, to begin with, and uh, one can drive these uh, continuity equation and the, uh, the momentum equation and the energy equation. Now, the only issue like whatever we saw in the previous case with the Navier-Stokes in the previous slide, we had seen this, that there is a problem of closure that occurs here. And the same problem occurs even here when you take this approach. So you, uh, um, you get essentially sigma ij. Sorry, I have used sigma ij and some place and tau ij, some other places. It's the same thing, it's stress tensor. So you essentially let, uh, get into stresses, stress tensor and your heat flux vector, uh, which are, uh, I mean, I mean, you don't, I mean, these are the terms which appear in your equation and you have to write some sort of a closure equation. So either you can do whatever we did earlier, write constitutive equations, use constitutive models like what we had done earlier, but then that is not very attractive because then why did you do, why did you start off with the Boltzmann equation at all? Because this equation, these equations are really anywhere sort of known to us. So the, uh, the challenge even in this approach is to be able to find out the closure terms, the sigma uh, terms and the heat flux terms without invoking, having to invoke uh, the Newton's law of viscosity or the Fourier's law um, of heat conduction here. So then the way it is done, there are now two methods uh, to do this. One is the Chapman and Scott method, where you say that uh, my distribution function F, I'm going to write it out in terms of a series uh, with epsilon as a small parameter, uh, where we essentially is F not, uh, essentially the, the way it is given here where F naught is the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. It essentially means that if you take gas at rest, the distribution that we would get is my F naught. Now F1 can be found using F naught. I mean, uh, there is, I mean, that's what this procedure essentially gives you. How does that F1 gets related to F naught? But very, very roughly, it is like a material derivative of F naught. F1 essentially becomes like a material derivative of F0. And you can say that F2 is like a material derivative of F1 and so on. So the thing is that if you can uh, find out uh, your F, and so F0 is known, I mean, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution can be found analytically. And then you can hopefully find out uh, the subsequent uh, distribution terms. And once you have these functions, uh, F, you can take uh, this sort of a moment of this function and obtain uh, your stress tensor, or you can uh, do this uh, integral and you can find out your heat flux vector. So, so the idea is that you can find out your stresses and heat flux and uh, one can take the first term here. If one takes the first term, I get sigma ij zero. If I take the first two terms, I get um, the sigma ij one as well and so on. So I can get sigma ij to any level, stress tensor to any level, I can get heat flux to any level. And if I were to substitute this stresses back into the, uh, uh, the Cauchy equation, then I can get the Euler equation or I can get the Navier-Stokes equation and, and so on. So you can see that this is how we can drive a whole, whole hierarchy of equations. And of course it tells us that the Navier-Stokes are of order epsilon and uh, the Bernard equation of, of order epsilon square and so on. And the remaining terms are dropped. So in the, in the Navier-Stokes equation, any terms of order uh, epsilon square, which essentially becomes a uh, number, um, and those terms are not there. Now, so this is the uh, Bernard order stress terms, which were derived by Bernard. Now, if you were to look at this, um, this stress term, of course, this is a very complex looking term. This is written in tensor notation. Uh, 
So if you want to expand it out, there are a very large number of these terms. Um, of course, there are some angular brackets and all some complex notation which has been used, which we need not get into. But what is important here is to sort of see what is the type of uh, structure that we are getting for these stress terms. What we are getting is, uh, this is a velocity gradient. This is another velocity gradient. So the product of two velocity gradients get involved. We also see theta, which is temperature. And uh, the product of I mean, temperature gradient is also there in our stress term. And this is a little bit of an odd thing. And people have commented on that, that this means that if there is a temperature gradient, purely temperature gradient, then as per this term, I should start having a stresses and maybe I can induce a flow. But this is one of the feature that I'm getting using the following the procedure that we have described in the previous slide. And uh, the other thing that you see is that there is a second derivative of uh, uh, temperature which is involved. And of course, we have seen that in the momentum equation, I would need to take a derivative of the stress tensor. So that means that this second order derivative will become a third order third order derivative. And of course, third order derivative means that I will also have to prescribe more number of boundary conditions for the solution. So these are some of the things that uh, one can sort of uh, look at these stresses and one can, one can see, but of course this is the complexity of the Burnett order stress terms is what sort of fits us. Uh, but of course, this is how one can uh, drive these equations. And if you were to put this stress tensor, uh, these stress terms in the, uh, Cauchy equation, then one would get the Burnett, Burnett equations. So this is one way of expanding our equations from Navier-Stokes to something which is a superset of that. The other approach is to take the grad moment, 13 moment approach. The idea by grad was that uh, normally we have five variables, our density, velocity, and temperature, and we work with them. So, and we of course saw that this uh, stress tensor and the heat flux vector appear as the unknowns in our equations. So the idea by, by grad was to write separate equations for these stress tensor and heat flux terms as well. So now what happens is that earlier we had five variables. These are my five variables. Now stress tensor, because it is symmetric, uh, instead of nine components, it should have nine components, but because of a symmetric nature, we have only six components. And it is also because it is also trace-free. Uh, so that means that there are only five independent components which are having. So I add five more, uh, come five more equations have to be now written for this stress tensor. And of course, heat flux is a vector, three quantities from there. So that's why I have 13 variables uh, that I am now going to write down the equations for. So, uh, and of course, somehow Brad used the word moment and that has stuck in the literature, but essentially we're talking about 13 variables uh, that we are going to write down the equations. And uh, here, the, there will be separate equations, evolution equations for the stress tensor and the heat flux vector. So that was the first interesting idea that was proposed by Grad. The next thing which Grad did was instead of using the expansion like the way we had seen earlier, uh, he preferred to write out the distribution function in terms of Hermite polynomials. And uh, yeah, is there a question here? Okay, so in terms of Hermite polynomials, and the thing is that this uh, coefficient, this is an exact thing if you can retain, uh, like all the, like there would be an infinite number of terms, but the issue arises that there, you have to evaluate these coefficients and to evaluate these coefficients, and because you can evaluate only a finite number of these coefficients, you have to truncate the series. So if you were to take all the infinite terms, and this is an exact representation, but the moment you truncate the series, uh, it becomes an approximation. And that leads to issues as we will see. So this was the two uh, things, two approaches or two uh, interesting ideas that were proposed by Grad, and based on which he essentially derived uh, this as the distribution function, of course, you can see that it's a truncated, it's not a, it's a truncated series. And once you have this distribution function, then you can evaluate your, um, uh, I mean, uh, stress systems and, or you can write out the stress and the heat flux equations as well. So this is, these are the additional equations. So the first three equations which are given here are the continuity, momentum and energy equation as before. But now you have a separate equation for, uh, uh, for stress tensor as well as for heat flux. 
of course there would be certain terms um, just like in turbulence we know that whenever we uh, i mean we have Reynolds stresses which are coming up uh, because of the convective terms here the same thing happens you need to it will always have a higher order moment that will get generated in this process and that is somehow i mean you have to just arbitrarily set it as zero and so on but this is the basic approach uh, which was proposed by grad and of course this is a much more involved sort of sort of an approach because there are now 13 variables for which you are solving of course you have differential equations for sigmas and uh, and q's so that means you need to have additional boundary conditions for their uh, I mean, that needs to be prescribed before you can actually obtain a solution. But that was the idea. So, uh, so having introduced these higher order continuum transport equations, the Bernard equations, the grad equations, now we will look at um, some of the contributions that we have made in this, in this area. Now, first, one of the first questions that we were asking is, can we obtain, is it possible to obtain an analytical solution of the Bernard equations? Now, looking at the Bernard equation, the complexity of the Bernard equations, it so, sort of looked like a very sort of stupid thing and we get an identical solution, but it turned out or we sort of proposed this sort of an idea. This is a cooked up idea and subject to criticism that we sort of said that, okay, can we combine our mathematical, our uh, physical understanding of a problem with a mathematical procedure and that way uh, use an iterative approach and solve these Bernard equations. So the idea is the following, that the way it has been proposed, the way the chart is shown here. So the idea is we start off with a problem for which the navier stokes solution is available, like flow in a channel or flow in a pipe or such things. So we start off with solution like that. Now, once we have a solution for, for, um, for the navier stokes, so we know this is how the density, velocity varies, density varies, whatever uh, varies. So u as a function of uh, all these things are, are known. And then of course, once u is known, the derivative of u can be found out analytically. Uh, so then we can evaluate the, so, so that is the first part. N now we uh, take a physical problem. We say that this is the problem that we are solving. Uh, this is the gas, this is the passage. And so therefore this is an the number and so on. So now we can find out what is the order of magnitude of that term that we have uh, are having. So we have seen that the Bernet stress is involved, for example, the product of the velocity gradients. So I can find out the, what is the magnitude of that velocity gradient. So, and then I will now see, so I have starting off with the Navier-Stokes, but I am now using the Navier-Stokes solution to evaluate terms which are of Bernet order. Okay, now I say that I will identify the terms which are the highest or uh, the most significant terms. And I'm now going to augment my earlier equation, which was the Navier-Stokes equation and augment those, the Navier-Stokes equation with this term, which has been identified from the Burnett order of the Burnett order. And I will try to solve this new equation, which is somewhere between the Navier-Stokes equation and the Burnett equation. And once I have a solution, I will now repeat the procedure that we have described. So this is how we, uh, we, we, we follow. So we are essentially bringing in uh, our physical understanding and physical or, and a solution of a lower order equation and combining it uh, with, uh, with the mathematical procedure and trying to solve a higher order equation. And we see that there, we can have convergence. We can have convergence in two ways. Either we can slowly add terms of the Burnett order to my lower order, lower order model and keep on solving it. And hopefully, and if you can uh, slowly solve, build up a solution and uh, get a solution for the final Burnett equation, that is one way of solving and getting to the solution of Burnett equation. The other way is that uh, we can show that uh, the remaining terms that we are not, I mean, are very small and therefore nothing else needs to be added to my equation. And therefore the solution that we have in hand is good enough. So these are the two ways in which conversions can happen. And of course, the interesting thing here is that I do not need to prescribe an additional boundary condition. We saw that the Burnett equation has third order derivative terms. So we would need to ascribe, prescribe normally uh, uh, another boundary condition, but here we don't need to uh, worry about having to prescribe an additional boundary condition till I pick the third order term and I start solving it. So this is, this is the procedure that we had proposed. And using this procedure, we were lucky to find uh, 
uh, at least for a Poisson flow problem, a solution, which is what it looks like here. The solution is what is shown here. And of course, one can check whether this is a good solution or not by putting it, substituting it back into the governing equation and looking at the left-hand side and the right-hand side and whether they match up or not. And of course, whether it's satisfying the boundary conditions or not. So what is being done here is we plot the difference of the left-hand side and the right-hand side, which you call as a residue. We divide it by the highest order term. Uh, so it becomes a normalized residue and we express it in a percentage. So that's my error uh, that is being plotted on the vertical axis and Knudsen number is what is there on my horizontal axis. And what we see here is that uh, if we say that 1% is acceptable, uh, then we see that the solution that we're proposing is actually a good solution till Knudsen number of 2.2. So this is how uh, we went about uh, solving this Burnett, Burnett equation. And then we said that can be solved for other cases. Uh, so we tried to look at uh, a flow in a circular tube, but first we have to, uh, we have to have Burnett equations in cylindrical coordinates. And because they were not available, we went in for a coordinate transformation sort of a thing and uh, obtain or transform these, uh, these stresses from Cartesian coordinates to cylindrical coordinates. And this is just to sort of show the complexity of the terms which are involved. This is just one of the terms which is involved. And if you were to write out these Burnett stress terms in cylindrical coordinates, uh, this is how it would look like. And of course, this is how the heat flux terms would look like. And of course, but once we, I mean, so we had the, essentially the bottom line is that we have uh, a solution or the uh, Burnett equation, the cylindrical coordinates, and then we can do the same procedure that we have done here earlier. And again, to show that we can actually get a good, uh, I mean, our iterative approach can give you a converged solution, which I'm not showing, but it is giving you that it is, it can be done. Now, moving ahead, what we would like to sort of, again, also show that it is also possible to solve the Bernard equation uh, using a perturbation-based uh, approach uh, under the assumption of low Mach number and low Reynolds number. Interestingly, this is the same, exactly the same assumption that was used earlier to solve the Navier-Stokes equation. And we realized that we could solve the uh, Bernard equation with, with this sort of an assumption. And uh, this is the type of solution that comes out. And uh, one can plot uh, and compare these solutions like what has been shown here. And the pressure versus uh, Y variation that we were talking about earlier can actually get captured in, in this model as well. And, and it gets captured reasonably well in this model here. Of course, we have also seen that one can solve this equation exactly uh, uh, by using some interesting, uh, introducing some interesting functions and uh, that can actually, you don't even have to use a perturbation method. This is something that we could resist recently demonstrate. So the summary of this is that uh, if you have to just summarize what we have said till now, we started off by saying that uh, the Navier-Stokes equations tend to fail in some situations and we need to look beyond that. So then we introduce the Burnett equations and the Grad equations and we are now introducing that it is possible to solve and obtain uh, analytical solution of the Burnett equations. So the question arises, can we not just move ahead with the Burnett equations and hopefully solve the problems um, that we were talking about earlier uh, using this Burnett equations. So the answer to this question turns out to be negative because there are a lot of issues with the Burnett equations. We have already seen that the Burnett equations require in general additional boundary conditions. Uh, of course, we have seen that they are generated from the Chapman and Scott series and whether the series converges is not proven. Uh, but the more, more important restrictions are what is shown here in red, is that these equations suffer from these so-called Bobbleyev instability, uh, which means that um, there are unphysical oscillations which, are, uh, which have been seen. Uh, if you just take a simple uh, 1D wave and uh, propagating in the fluid and you in a, a, a low pressure gas and try to solve that, you will find that there are, uh, I mean, within the, uh, Burnett framework, you will find that there are unphysical oscillations that this equation, the solution will start giving you. And uh, the most important uh, issue is that these Burnett equations uh, give you 
they do not essentially satisfy with the second law of thermodynamics. Now, because of these uh, limitations of these Burnett equations, there have been several variants of these Burnett equations like BJK Burnett, augmented Burnett, simplified Burnett, and so on. So we don't have time to get into these variants of Burnett equations, but all these one, uh, uh, variants have been introduced. And of course, the first thing it tells you that there is something inconsistent or something wrong with the Burnett equation itself. That's why we need these variants. That's the first thing. But these variants are mostly obtained by adding or subtracting, I mean, you say that this is a term which is leading to an oscillation. So I can get rid of that term. So you just arbitrarily remove that term from your equation and you solve the remaining terms. So you can see that that's the approach that has been taken. Uh, and of course, these are all uh, works for that. Maybe it will work for that particular problem that we are trying to solve, but they are not, if you take those set of equations and uh, apply it to a different problem, those will start giving you, showing you some other inconsistency. So the bottom line is all these variants are actually inconsistent. And that's why, uh, I mean, this whole approach starting from the Burnett equations is, uh, I mean, uh, needs a revisit, or at least this is not doing the intended part. And of course, you can sort of trace that to uh, the origin. We just said that you are getting F0, F1, F2, and F2 is like related to F1 through a material derivative and so on, or F1 is related to F0 through a material derivative. I mean, very roughly saying that. So you can see that we are not invoking like entropy, consistency, or any physical principle there. We are just saying that it's a more a mathematical way of uh, obtaining the various distribution functions and going ahead with that without any physics being appropriate, physics being thrown in. And that's why it leads to these, um, these physical inconsistencies that people are finding. Now moving ahead, so if not grad burn, uh, Burnett equations, what about the grad equations? So again, it turns out that there are issues with the grad equations. Uh, of course, it, first thing is how many moments we can take. And of course, as we had said, uh, without getting to too many details that even these uh, grad equations will generate higher order moments and how do we close them? Uh, that is not clear. Of course, how many moments should be retained itself is not clear. What is the meaning of these higher order moments? Physical meaning of these higher moments is not clear. Uh, of course, the requirement of additional boundary conditions, something which I had mentioned, uh, especially when in the context of uh, stresses and heat flux, it becomes extremely unclear what we are doing there. Now, the interesting thing is that although Grad had uh, proposed these equations when he applied it to the, to the shock wave problem, which is the problem that people were struggling with, he found that uh, the range of Mach number over which the solution applies uh, with Mach, uh, with grad equation improves slightly, but not too much. So after all these uh, complexities, uh, the solution does not seem to improve too much. And uh, the worst part is that uh, if you were to look at the distribution function, uh, there are negative values of distribution function, which have been noted. And of course, this is a probability distribution function and of course negative values means that there is something unphysical which is going on. So because of which the grad equations also uh, tend to fail and of course uh, one finds several variants of these equations in the literature. Uh, the most popular of these being the regularized uh, variants, the regularized moments equations which have been recently proposed, the R13 equations. So in general one can say that the Burnett equations and the Grad equations do not seem to perform well, especially at the high Noxian number. So one can ask a further difficult question and say that, is it possible to drive better, or at least alternate ways of uh, finding the moment equations? And of course, and will they be better? So with this, I will now come, so we have essentially covered the first two parts here. Um, we essentially have looked at very quickly what goes on in this approach, the Chapman and Stock ex uh, expansion approach and the grad moment approach. Now we will introduce uh, the third part, which was introduced by us earlier. So we realized that uh, the issue with these uh, equations is the thermodynamic inconsistency. So if we were to sort of ditch the way uh, the distribution function is obtained in the other cases, and obtain uh, sort of uh, or write out the distribution function in a manner which is thermodynamically consistent. Uh, and this is where we relied on something from the literature and something we had to find on our own. Uh, 
So there was some work, early work, which was done by Mahindra as part of his PhD thesis in HBNI Mumbai, uh, where he essentially showed that this is how one can write out the distribution function, which is entropy consistent. We realized that there are some issues uh, with this function, which we had to correct. But the bottom line is that the, uh, the distribution function, which we are now finding, uh, is consistent uh, with this uh, entropy generation. And it is also uh, making sure that when the collision between the molecules are happening, uh, there is no, uh, the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy is being satisfied at the molecular stage. So that means that uh, these are, uh, so these distribution function, which has been dialed in now, have all these physical properties which are dialed in. And we now use this distribution function and repeat the mathematical procedure and obtain the moment equations. And we are, uh, call these equations as an O13 moment equation. And O has been added for Onsager because essentially the uh, reciprocity principle has been, uh, has been, uh, has been added here. Uh, so uh, th this distribution function is, is uh, on, I mean, is, uh, consistent with this uh, symmetry principle. So uh, of course, the the first three equations for mass, momentum, and energy do not change. What changes is the uh, evolution equation for the stresses and for the heat flux, which have been now obtained here. And now just to look at the because of course these equations are have to be rigorously tested. But just as a simple sanity check, we just try to look at what type of closure terms are there in the grad equation and what type of uh, closure terms in our, are there in our equation. And uh, if we were to compare what sort of things come out. So there are three uh, terms which are there in the, uh, in the I mean, which, which are there. And in the grad approach, they are evaluated as zero and this term and as zero. And in our case, uh, they turn out to be very similar. The third terms look different, but it is if you were to put gamma is equal to five by three for monatomic gas, then of course this becomes zero. And of course we are not limited to gamma is equal to 5.3, then you would get something like what is shown here. So, uh, I mean, so there are several advantages in this. So, I mean, this is just to sort of show that it is very, I mean, very, uh, at least it looks uh, uh, sensible because we are starting with a very different approach we wanted to make sure that we are not doing something which is totally off. And this slide sort of demonstrate that we are reasonably okay. And of course we can use the distribution function to close equations uh, and obtain this stress tensor and the heat flux uh, vector here. And uh, if we were to do that, this is the uh, sigma xx or the uh, normal stresses and the shear stresses will turn out like this, and the heat flux will turn out like this. So, uh, I mean, so again, we call this as O Burnett or Onsaga Burnett equations. And we have now, so I mean, so this is the, uh, the new set of equations that we have recently proposed. And there are several advantages of these equations. Interestingly, the first one is that if you were to look at these equations carefully, and we find that there are no additional uh, second, I mean, there are no third order terms in our equations. That's the first very interesting observation that we made. And of course, there is nothing that we have dialed in here to that effect. We are simply starting over the distribution function, which is thermodynamically consistent. We are after that following the mathematical procedure and we're obtaining the equations. And we find that there are no third order terms. Of course, we know that uh, Burnett order equations, if you have to add, give a third boundary condition. We know that from experience that we cannot, for any problem, it's not possible to prescribe an additional boundary condition. And in these O Burnett equations, we do not need any additional boundary conditions as well. The O13 equations turn out to be requiring exactly the same number of boundary conditions that are required in the grad equations. And of course, they are less than what is required in the R13 equations. And of course, there is no dependence of stress terms on the temperature gradient. So this is something which has been consistently uh, commented upon by researchers in the past, uh, that the stress term should not depend on the temperature gradient. And again, this is an interesting feature that we find, again, from our equations, that there is no such dependence of our equations. And we have done the type of test uh, which led to the Bobolev instability. And we again find that our equations are unconditionally stable. So, uh, so I mean, of course, we sort of believe that we're starting off with something which is more physical and therefore we are obtaining equations which are more physical. Uh, 
Now, as a final sort of a thing, what we will look at very quickly is, I know I'm running out of time. So what we'll look at very quickly is we'll look at some simple validation of these equations, which, have, which we have done for a reasonably large number of cases with no inconsistencies found. And only one case I'm going to present here, which is a force driven Poisson flow. So essentially what happens is uh, these sort of uh, equations as we have seen becomes very complex and it is not possible to solve these equations uh, even when it is a pressure driven flow. So what people have tried to do is to say that there is an external force which is driving this flow. Uh, so it's a force driven uh, Poisson flow, that's how it becomes. So the coupling between pressure and velocity essentially reduces. So, um, so with that uh, sort of uh, under that framework, one can obtain from our Obernet equations. Uh, the Obernet equation essentially gets simplified to what is shown here. And then one can uh, plot the various quantities, essentially solve them um, semantically and obtain these variations of velocity, density, pressure, and temperature, as well as for stresses, all these various stresses, heat fluxes, and so on. And of course, there has been a comparison which has been made with large number of theories and uh, numerical data, DSMC data, MD data. And of course, uh, one can look at what is better and so on. But what is again good is that in all these cases, all these variables, the trends and all are ex extremely well captured. The accuracy is also, the model is also uh, quite good. Uh, so uh, this uh, sort of shows that again, that uh, uh, overall, this approach looks reasonable. And as we had said that in other cases, other flows that we have solved, uh, we are all, these are all giving some consistent results. Of course, we would like to have more people look at our equations and then convince themselves or otherwise that these equations are fine or not. Now, as a final comment, what I would like to make is that we have these uh, higher order equations and we were thinking, is it possible explain something which is not necessarily sort of, uh, um, I mean, something which we normally tend to overlook or something which we which cannot explain within our standard Navier-Stokes Fourier formulation. So one thing we started looking at uh, was a non-Fourier heat conduction. Essentially what happens it with the Fourier's law, uh, we know that uh, the Fourier's law states that whenever there is a temperature gradient, there's a heat flux and uh, there is no time delay which happens. So the moment you introduce a temperature gradient, there will be heat flux which will be uh, set up immediately and vice, and vice versa. But we know that that is not going to be physically possible. There's always going to be a delay. And this delay was introduced by Catania using this uh, first term in this equation here. And this was essentially just a very simple Taylor series expansion which was done and uh, somehow I have lost my cursor. So, okay, so the first term was introduced here and this is a very totally arbitrary sort of um, uh, extension uh, that one could write. And of course it's a non-Fourier model that, um, that was introduced. One of the simplest non-Fourier model that we had. So we were trying to see if we could explain this. Yeah, essentially what we can see is go to the grad equation, set velocity and stresses as zero. And one could find that this is exactly the same form that is given by the Catania's model comes out. And then one can see that this is nothing but my tau term, which was introduced earlier, which is the time delay. And the time delay is nothing but should take a value of three mu by two P, uh, which one can evaluate as 2.7 to minus 10 of the order of 10 to minus 10 seconds for air at STP. So, I mean, this is just a simple extension of what, what one can do with these sort of higher order models besides looking at just uh, the high notes and number flows. So, so overall, I would sort of summarize and saying that by saying that the slip flow do exhibit several non-intuitive flow behavior and uh, which sort of uh, means that uh, there is a need, there is a definite need for looking beyond the Navier-Stokes equations. And we in, uh, introduced the Burnett and the Grad equations and we showed that it is possible to solve the Burnett equations analytically using the iterative approach that we had proposed. And using this one can go to as high an Utsa number, which is 2.2, which was very surprising because here we are essentially going into the, the, into the transition regime. And people have not been able to get into the transition regime, even using the, the numerical, I mean, with the sort of a continuum beside models. I mean, Navier, Stokes, Burnett, and so on. They, 
tend to not give any meaningful solution in this regime. Of course, one can access this regime through the DSMC and the MD sort of a simulation, but not from the equation point of view. So this is, uh, so it was very heartening to just see that at least for one problem, we are able to get to uh, the, uh, to the transition regime from an analytical approach, which was very, I mean, this was very heartening. And uh, of course, we said that there are several issues, deficiencies with this Burnett equation, the grad equations. And uh, then we tried to propose uh, these Burnett and grad equations, a uh, new set of starting from a very different sort of a philosophy. And we call them as the O13 and the O Burnett equations respectively. And of course we have been uh, testing, continuously testing these equations and we're looking at more and more test cases which can be meaningfully solved for these problems. And there are still a lot of issues, especially in terms of boundary conditions that we sometimes, especially if we have to test our O13 equations, the boundary conditions turns out to be still uh, something that we are still trying to crack. And of course, see if we can solve these equations numerically and uh, uh, try to see whether we can increase the range over which these Knudsen numbers can apply. So this is essentially what I have to say. Of course, this is the work of a lot of uh, different students. Narendra has been very, very active here in a lot of things. He has done a lot of things. All the major derivation was done by him and it was followed up by Ravi Jadav. And uh, Ashwarya did some, uh, uh, the exact, uh, or the perturbation-based solution of the uh, Burnett yeah. equations and then so, the exact solution good evening, of the, everyone. I hope you can uh, see the slides and if you can hear me. Thanks to Samahin Verma for your experimental data uh, that I was shown earlier from heat transfer and sudden expansion essentially came out from the work of the I know the turbulence group and uh, uh, I've been working in turbulence, but of late I have uh, been more interested in this topic of uh, and of course, uh, what uh, we equations have, are there uh, which could take us beyond the news. Good evening, everyone. So I thought I would share uh, the slides and if you can hear and the details of whatever I had presented has come out uh, wonderful opportunity to uh, talk about uh, some of the work uh, that we have based on the session. I know the turbulence group and uh, could, uh, I've been working uh, in turbulence. Essentially, detail, I have been whatever I have said in more detail, I mean, the mechanical details uh, what equations uh, are, there are there in this, uh, in this book. Could take and us especially, I would say that if you are interested in the grad equation, the Burnett equations, we have given a step-by-step derivation of how one can obtain starting from the Boltzmann equation, if you are interested and the Navier-Stokes equation, it will give you a step-by-step -step derivation. Of course, that derivation runs into 20, 30 pages, but you can essentially take this book hopefully and take it and do this, that derivation in the class. And you can have very good pointers about how you can then drive the Burnett equations and other equations. So, so this is all I have to say, and I would be happy to, and, uh, to answer any questions and thanks to Professor Mayendwarma again for giving me this uh, 